The Hellbound Heart Chapter 5 Sometimes it seemed that eons came and went while he lingered in the wall. Eons that some clue would later reveal to have been the passing of hours or even minutes. But now things had changed. He had a chance of escape. His spirit soared at the thought. It was a frail chance. He didn't deceive himself about that. There were several reasons his best efforts might falter. Julia, for one. He remembered her as a trite, preening woman whose upbringing had curbed her capacity for passion. He had untamed her, of course, once. He remembered the day among the thousands of times he had performed that act with some satisfaction. She had resisted no more than was needful for her vanity. Then succumbed with such naked fervor, he had almost lost control of himself. In other circumstances, he might have snatched her from under her would-be husband's nose. But fraternal politics counseled otherwise. In a week or two, he would have tired of her and been left not only with a woman whose body was already an eyesore to him, but also a vengeful brother on his heels. It hadn't been worth the hassle. Besides, there had been new worlds to conquer. He had left the day after to go east, to Hong Kong and Sri Lanka, to wealth and adventure. He'd had them too, at least for a while. But everything slipped through his fingers sooner or later. And with time, he began to wonder whether it was circumstance that denied him a good hold on his earnings, or whether he simply didn't care enough to keep what he had. The train of thought, once begun, was a runaway, everywhere, in the wreckage around him. He found evidence to support the same bitter thesis, that he had encountered nothing in his life, no person, no state of mind or body he wanted sufficiently to suffer even passing discomfort for. A downward spiral began. He spent three months in a wash of depression and self-pity that bordered on suicidal. But even that solution was denied him by his newfound nihilism. If nothing was worth living for, it followed, didn't it, that there was nothing worth dying for either? He stumbled from one such sterility to the next until all thoughts were rotted away by whatever opiate his immoralities could earn him. How had he first heard of Le Marchand's box? He couldn't remember. In a bar, maybe? Or a gutter? From the lips of a fellow derelict? At the time, it was merely a rumor. This dream of a pleasure dome where those who had exhausted the trivial delights of the human condition might discover a fresh definition of joy. And the route to this paradise? There were several, he was told. Charts of the interface between the real and the realer still, made by travelers whose bones had long since gone to dust. One such chart was in the vaults of the Vatican, hidden in code in a theological work unread since the Reformation. Another, in the form of an origami exercise, was reported to have been in the possession of the Marquis de Sade, who used it while imprisoned in the Bastille to barter with a guard for paper on which to write the 120 days of Sodom. Yet another was made by a craftsman, a maker of singing birds, called Les Marchands, in the form of a musical box of such elaborate design, a man might toy with it half a lifetime and never get inside. Stories, stories, 
Yet since he had come to believe in nothing at all, it was not so difficult to put the tyranny of verifiable truth out of his head. And it passed the time musing drunkenly on such fantasies. It was in Dusseldorf, where he'd gone smuggling heroin, that he again encountered the story of Le Marchand's box. His curiosity was piqued once more, but this time he followed the story up until he found its source. The man's name was Kircher, though he probably laid claim to half a dozen others. Yes, the German could confirm the existence of the box, and yes, he could see his way to letting Frank have it. The price? Small favors, here and there. Nothing exceptional. Frank did the favors, washed his hands, and claimed his payment. There had been instructions from Kircher on how to best break the seal on Le Marchand's device. Instructions that were part pragmatic, part metaphysical. To solve the puzzle is to travel, he'd said, or something like that. The box, it seemed, was not just the map of the road, but the road itself. This new addiction quickly cured him of dope and drink. Perhaps there were other ways to bend the world to suit the shape of his dreams. He came back to the house on Lodovico Street, to the empty house between whose walls he was now imprisoned, and prepared himself, just as Kircher had detailed, for the challenge of solving Le Marchand's configuration. He had never in his life been so abstemious, nor so single-minded. In the days before the onslaught on the box, he led a life that would have shamed a saint, focusing all his energies on the ceremonies ahead. He had been arrogant in his dealing with the order of the gash. He saw that now. But there were everywhere, in the world and out of it, forces that encouraged such arrogance because they traded on it. That in itself would not have undone him. No, his real error had been the naive belief that his definition of pleasure significantly overlapped with that of the Cenobites. As it was, they had brought incalculable suffering. They had overdosed him on sensuality until his mind teetered on madness. Then they'd initiated him into experiences that his nerves still convulsed to recall. They had called it pleasure, and perhaps they'd meant it, perhaps not. It was impossible to know with these minds. They were so hopelessly, flawlessly ambiguous. They recognized no principles of reward and punishment by which he could hope to win some respite from their tortures nor were they touched by any appeal for mercy. He tried that over the weeks and months that separated the solving of the box from today. There was no compassion to be had on the side of the schism. There was only the weeping and the laughter, tears of joy sometimes, for an hour without dread, a breath's length even. Laughter coming just as paradoxically in the face of some new horror, fashioned by the engineer for the provision of grief. There was a further sophistication to the torture, devised by a mind that understood exquisitely the nature of suffering. The prisoners were allowed to see into the world they had once occupied, their resting places. When they were not enduring pleasure, looked out onto the very locations where they had once worked the configuration that had brought them here. In Frank's case, onto the upper room of number 55 Lodovico Street. For the best part of a year, it had been an unilluminating view. Nobody had ever stepped into the house. And then they'd come, Rory and the lovely Julia. And hope had begun again. There were ways to escape, he'd heard it whispered. Loopholes in the system that might allow a mind supple or cunning enough egress 
into the room from which it had come. If a prisoner were able to make such an escape, there were no way that the Hierophants could follow. They had to be summoned across the schism. Without such an invitation, they were left like dogs on the doorstep, scratching and scratching but unable to get in. Escape, therefore, if it could be achieved, brought with it a decree absolute, total dissolution of the mistaken marriage which the prisoner had made. It was a risk worth taking. Indeed, it was no risk at all. What punishment could be meted out worse than a thought of pain without hope of release? He had been lucky. Some prisoners had departed from the world without leaving sufficient sign of themselves from which, given an adequate collision of circumstances, their bodies might be remade. He had. Almost his last act, bar the shouting, had been to empty his testicles onto the floor. Dead sperm was a meager keepsake of his essential self, but enough. When dear brother Rory sweet, butter-fingered Rory, had let his chisel slip, there was something of Frank to profit from the pain. He had found a finger hold for himself and a glimpse of strength with which he might haul himself to safety. Now it was up to Julia. Sometimes suffering in the wall, he thought she would desert him out of fear. Either that or she'd rationalize the vision she'd seen and decide she'd been dreaming. If so, he was lost. He lacked the energy to repeat the appearance. But there were signs that gave him cause for hope. The fact that she returned to the room on two or three occasions, for instance, and simply stood in the gloom, watching the wall. She'd even muttered a few words on a second visit, though he'd caught only scrapes. The word, here, was amongst them, and waiting, and soon, enough to keep him from despair. He had another prop to his optimism. She was lost, wasn't she? He'd seen that in her face, when before the day Rory had chiseled himself, she and his brother had had an occasion to be in the room together. He'd read the looks between the lines, the moments when her guard had slipped and the sadness and frustration she felt were apparent. Yes, she was lost, married to a man she felt no love for and unable to see a way out. Well, here he was. They could save each other the way the poets promised lovers should. He was a mystery. He was darkness. He was all she had dreamed of. And if she would only free him, he would service her. Oh yes, until her pleasure reached that threshold that, like all thresholds, was a place where the strong grew stronger and the weak perished. Pleasure was pain there, and vice versa. And he knew it well enough to call it home.